into your life. Haven't you appreciated Pastor C.D. Brooks's answer to the questions? It takes me an hour to create the questions, and it takes him one minute to answer them. <laughs> Pastor C.D. Brooks, come and answer the questions we've been raising. Pastor, what have you got for us tonight? All right. The first question, Pastor, when Christ was on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do, who was forgiven? The people who were crucifying him at the cross or all sinners? There is an awesome prophecy in the Old Testament that actually pinpointed the coming of our Lord, his crucifixion, and then the end of national probation for Israel, which would take place about three and a half years after the death of our Lord. Christ was aware of this time schedule. And so, in a very special sense, he was praying for those who were crucifying him. But in a broad sense, for all of us who follow Satan instead of him. You know, it's an amazing thing that people are so willing to follow the enemy. And, and obviously, there is a spell that has to be broken. Christ was praying for all who need forgiveness and for many that prayer will be answered because they will be willing to accept his forgiveness. Someone wants to know, did Pastor Finley say last night that Satan raises the wicked dead? Please clarify. I listened very carefully back here uh, to the monitor, and I know that Pastor Finley didn't say that. And it's possible sometimes to misunderstand. He was talking about the millennium, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 speaks of the rest of the dead not living again until the thousand years are finished. And then they will be raised, not by Satan. If he could have done it, he would have done it before the thousand years were finished. His problem is that he has no one to tempt, no one to create a war with, no one to get into devilment. All he can do is walk around a ruined earth and consider the ruin he has wrought. And when the thousand years are over, by the power of God, the wicked will be brought forth. This is the second resurrection. There are going to be two. If we must sleep, you want to come up in the first one. One of our friends wants to know, is it a sin to have a transfusion? The answer, obviously, is no. There was a text read by Pastor Finley, and, and incidentally, that was last night, from Leviticus chapter 3, that God forbids his people eating blood and eating fat. When you ingest it, that's quite different than when good blood is transfused into your arm. Many, many lives have been saved through this technology. And I thank God for it. I've never had it myself, but I've had to prepare for it a time or two. Many on the battlefields who've been mangled and broken and have lost most of their life's force have been saved because of blood transfusion. The Bible does not forbid it. As a matter of fact, the technology was not known in Bible times. What the Bible does forbid is the eating of blood and the eating of fat. And we should be very careful to get it straight and then do what God has said. Someone says here, Pastor Finley last night denied the old adage that, when, that you die when your time comes. Until then, you can't die. Is this true? Do you have to wait until your time comes? <laughs> That's a good question. I was walking across a little catwalk between the Congress and Senate in Brasilia, and I think it's up about 17 floors, and a little old lady talked me into that. She walked across and turned and looked at me and said, Are you afraid to follow me out here? Now, you know men can't stand that kind of talk. <laughs> but once I got on that thing and it began to do this, I prayed a little prayer, and I said, Lord, if you help me across this and back, you won't have to answer this prayer again. <laughs> but when I got back, she congratulated me. She said, you know, most people are afraid, but you weren't. And besides, she said, I think if you fall, it's your time. And I, <laughs> and I said, no, I do not believe that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 17, the Bible says, be not overmuch Wicked, neither be thou foolish, why shouldest thou die before thy time? 
That's very clear. There are many people who through wickedness have hastened the day of their departure from this life. Not only that, the first commandment with a promise says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Proverbs 10, 27, The fear of the Lord prolongeth years, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. So it's possible to live wisely, carefully, and above all, obediently to the principles of God's Word. And your life, quite possibly, can be extended. I heard something last night. Every cigarette shortens your life by about 13 minutes. And if you smoke two or three packs a day, you're really lopping it off. It's better to do what God says and give yourself the optimum opportunity for a long life down here and a good life on top of that. Our final question for tonight, Pastor, last night's sermon was very helpful. However, people have now pointed me to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Please explain. This is very perplexing. Walter, that question came last year when we were with Pastor Finley. And I suppose it'll come every time, First Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. This know also that in the last days, uh, the Bible tells us, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And there are some who take that uh, next that says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And they assume that that gives them permission to eat anything under the sun. But really... Without qualifications, you should be confused. But the text contains qualifications. I might as well answer it the way we did last year. First of all, you need to define what a creature is. A creature is anything created by the Creator. That's a creature. And now I ask this audience to respond. Pastor Ortiz is my associate and good friend. Is he a creature? Please answer me. Is he a creature? Of course he is. Now let's read the text again. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. <laughs> Without qualification, God would endorse cannibalism. And certainly we don't want to eat Pastor our teas, isn't that right? <laughs> Then what are the qualifying words? It says, commanding to abstain from meats which. Now it tells us which. Commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God. What creature? Those which God created to be received. The clean ones that Pastor Finley talked about last night. Not the unclean ones. I don't want to upset your delicate sensibilities, but without the qualification, you would have to try a maggot sandwich. And God certainly doesn't wish that upon his people. Thank you for your questions. We'll keep answering them. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Fenley and the staff here at Discoveries in Prophecy once again have provided music for your listening pleasure. It's a joy to introduce to you tonight from the state of Arkansas, Steve Darmody. Let's welcome him as he comes. Steve? Jesus, be my constant refuge, sheltering me from sin and strife. Grant the peace my heart is needing, giver of eternal life.
Take my soul into your keeping Only then will I endure All the change my heart is needing May you find my life is pure Jesus God Protect me, hide me underneath your wings, resting in your sanctuary. Only then can my heart sing. Jesus, be my constant refuge. Lead me. Tonight, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come from different backgrounds, some with strong religious faith, but some of our backgrounds are not strong religious faith at all. We come to you because there's no other place to come. We come to your word to discover truth. And we pray tonight that Jesus would be our instructor, that as we look to your word, that we would see new truths inspired by the Holy Spirit. Give us the vision to see them and the courage to follow them. In Christ's name, amen. Our topic tonight is a question that's asked often in this series. Why are there so many different denominations? Have you ever wondered if there's one God, one Bible, why are there so many different churches that dot the hillsides? Whether it's the United States or Canada, or whether it's St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, or whether it's some of those great cathedrals throughout Europe, one thing is for certain, the world has tens of thousands and millions of church congregations. Why are there so many different denominations? And with this maze of denominations, have you ever wondered how can I find the truth? How can I know what truth is? Have you ever seen one of those churches that hangs a sign on its door that says, don't come in here because you'll find error and not truth? Isn't it quite amazing that every one of these churches all claims to have the truth? Well, you can start at the beginning of the alphabet and go to the Assembly of God and then on to the Baptists, then on to the Congregationalists, then on to the Disciples of Christ, and then you can go throughout the alphabet and there's a, a name for a church based on almost every letter of the alphabet and you can go right to the end to the Zionists. Everyone claiming that they have truth. How can you discover truth. The average person is confused with this bewildering array of churches. The average person sometimes simply throws up their hands and says, because there is so much error and because there is so much man-madeness in religion, many an honest person says, I'm not going to go to any church. It's possible to have an accident on the right-hand side of the road or the left, isn't it? If you're driving down the road, would you rather be hit by a truck on the right or go off the bridge on the left? You say, Mark, those options aren't too good. You know, the devil has many deceptions. One deception is grasp on to any church, don't ask any questions, and be quite naive. The other side of that coin is, is to be so cynical and so skeptical that you rule out everything. 
the Bible clearly describes why there are so many different denominations. And it helps us find our way through the maze of confusion. It helps intelligent, thinking, rational people to understand where these churches came from and how to ferret out truth from error. The Bible says in Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. When Jesus was on earth, Christ said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Jesus said he was going to build a church. But after Christ built the Christian church in the early centuries, man-made teachings came in. And Jesus said, I will reveal my secrets unto my servants, the prophets. In other words, as you study prophecy, you will understand what happened to the early Christian church, why it happened, and you'll understand how to discover and find truth for yourself today. This series is called Discoveries in Prophecy, and the book that we're especially studying together is what book of the Bible? What's it called? The book of what? Revelation. And what book of the Bible is Revelation? It's the last. So we're studying the last book of the Bible, written for the last generation of men and women to live on a planet called Earth. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God revealed to him of things shortly to come to pass. One of the most amazing prophecies of the book of Revelation is found in Revelation 6 and chapter 1 and onward. Revelation's four horsemen describe the progression of Christianity. They describe what has happened in the Christian church, why it's happened, and how to find truth. In fact, the Bible says, read it with me please, the Lamb opened one of the seals. Who is the Lamb? Who's that? Jesus. So we are reading about Jesus opening the seals of history. We're reading about Jesus unrolling the scroll of history. We're reading about Jesus explaining what happened in early Christian history. This is not man's idea. This is not some human church revelation of history, but the Lamb, the Christ that died for us, now begins in Revelation to explain Christian history. John, in prophetic vision, with Jesus explaining to him the history of the Christian church, looks up and he sees four horsemen riding in heaven. Bible prophecy often uses symbols. It was Confucius that said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so God uses prophetic pictures to help us to understand succinctly history. And the future of Christianity is revealed in these four horsemen. John looks up, and as Jesus opens the first of the seals, a rider on a white horse gallops across heaven. He explodes off the page of the Bible to us. And there, that rider on the white horse is described in Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. In the Bible, John, as he looks up into vision, saw the New Testament Christian church. He saw the early apostles preaching, and he said, just as the Roman general who was victorious would ride a white horse as he conquered his enemies. God used symbols that people in those days understood. John was exiled by the Romans on the island of Patmos when he was writing. God gave him a vision in language that he could understand. Often, generals rode horses. Horses were a symbol of triumph. A white horse was written by the generals of Rome as they triumphed over their enemies. So, Jesus is pictured as triumphantly riding through the first century and the Christian church with its power, shooting the arrows of the word, armed with the sword of the spirit, would conquer the armies and navies of Rome. So the white horse with the rider with the bow 
represented the Christian faith. In fact, one Roman writer writing about Christianity said, you are everywhere. You are in our armies. You are in our navies. You are in our senate. You are in our marketplaces. You are in our universities. You are everywhere. And indeed, the Christian church defeated the military might of Rome. In the New Testament, white regularly symbolizes apostolic purity. A church with pure, true doctrines. In Revelation 6, the rider on the white horse represents true doctrines and Christianity triumphing. In Revelation chapter 12, God changes the symbolism and he describes a bride who is aligned to one husband, who is faithful to one husband. The woman in white in Revelation chapter 12 represents God's church in her allegiance and fidelity and loyalty to her husband Christ. This church in Revelation 12 does not go harlot in harlotry after the world. She does not prostitute herself by leaving her true husband Jesus and going out into the world. So white throughout Revelation represents the pure faith, the true faith, the triumphant faith. The disciples armed with the Word of God, filled with the love of Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Colossians 1, verse 23, the gospel, the Apostle Paul says, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. The gospel made a mighty impact in the New Testament. A band of 12 disciples filled with the Holy Spirit took the gospel message to the end of the earth the Bible says, Acts 5, verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. When the church was pure, it grew. When the church based its doctrines on the Bible, it grew. When the faith of the New Testament church was on the scriptures, God honored that and blessed it. Satan saw the church growing. Satan saw the church triumphing. The motto of the disciples, read it with me please, in Acts 5 verse 29, read it please, we ought to obey God rather than men. Do you believe that? Amen. We ought to obey God rather than men. Indeed, the New Testament church took that as their motto, and the church grew and prospered. Satan, knowing that, came dramatically against the Christian church. And so we enter into the second phase, the second era of Christian history. A second seal opens. Jesus opens that seal. And the Bible says a rider on a red horse explodes across the sky. And the scripture describes that red horse, a horse symbolized as dripping in blood. The rider with a sword dipped in blood. The Bible says, Revelation 6, verse 4, Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another. There was given to him a great sword. Satan saw that he could not destroy the Christian church. It was moving ahead in triumph. The gospel was going from city to city, from village to village. So Satan raised up vicious persecution. Christians were thrown to the lions. Christians were martyred at the stake and burned at the stake. And from a pure, uncompromised faith represented in the white horse, Jesus unfolds the scroll of Christian history and discusses a blood-stained faith. And the church is being persecuted. The Roman armies marched against that early church. The persecutions of pagan Roman emperors like Decian and Diocletian, Christians thrown to lions, Christians burned at the stake, Christians who knew what it meant to stand fast for God. There are people today that say to me, Pastor, if I make this decision, my husband may really get angry. My wife really may get angry. My parents really may get angry. They say, if I make this decision, I may even lose a job for the Bible Sabbath. 
or it's so difficult because I have cravings for alcohol and tobacco. Think about what early Christians faced. Today, sometimes men and women want a crossless, easygoing, accommodating Christianity. But every test makes our faith stronger. Every time we stand for God, he gives us the power and strength to do what we could never do. The martyrs did not face the lions alone. The martyrs did not face the torture that they faced and burning at the stake alone. God gave them extra strength and extra power. The Red Horse period from approximately 100 A.D., to 323 A.D., a blood-stained faith, 200-some-odd years of vicious persecution. But, as Tertullian said, that early Roman writer, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. No matter how many Christians you kill, when their blood is shed, others take their place. Others pick up the torch of faith. Satan knew that he could not destroy the church by persecuting it. Because the more he persecuted these Christians, the more faithful they became, the more stalwart they became, the more courageous they became, and the more the church grew. So Satan changed his strategy. Jesus, the lamb unrolling the seals of history, knew he would. And the Bible says, when he opened the third seal... I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld in lo a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, from the white of apostolic purity to a black horse of compromise with balances. The church would be weighed in the balances and found wanting. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. In other words, there's no good solid spiritual food. I'll give anything for it. Three measures of barley for a penny. See thou hurt not the oil and the wine, the truth of the gospel. So here you have now in the fourth, fifth century, the black horse period. Satan couldn't stop the church. So he decided to bring pagans into the church. He decided to dilute the faith of the church. Now Paul warned about this, reading from the book of Acts. Therefore, Paul is talking to the Christian church. He's talking to Christian leaders and he said, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, Paul says, after my death, my departure, savage wolves, that's pagan Roman persecution, that's the sword, the stake, the rack, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves. Where would they come from, everybody? From where? Among what? Yourselves. He was addressing the Christian church, the leaders. From among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse. That's crooked. That is things that depart from the Bible, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Acts 20, verse 28 to 30. Compromises would enter the Christian church. The church would grow. The church would become popular. Pagans would come into the church. The Bible says in Daniel 8, verse 12, speaking about this very time, read it with me, please. He cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Truth would be cast to the ground. The historical setting is this. The Roman Empire was falling apart. Many pagans were invading the empire. The barbarian tribes were coming down from the north in the great Germanic invasions. As these pagans entered into the Roman Empire, the heads of the church, as well as the heads of the state, united together in an attempt to bring Christianity and paganism together to save the empire. Unfortunately, Bible doctrines that were known by the apostles and stood for by the apostles were 
subtly shifted to accommodate the pagans coming into the church. Salvation through Jesus was replaced by the requirements of the church. The church began to grow. Church councils, church dogma began to take the place of the pure truth of God's word. Substitutes were made. Substitutes for the very commandments of God. One of the questions that was raised by those early church leaders and early state leaders was, how can we make Christianity accommodating to the pagans? How can we help these hordes of pagans that are coming into the church to feel comfortable? One of the thoughts was this. Why don't we take some of the pagan gods and why don't we bring them into the church and rename them in harmony with the saints? If you looked at this picture, most people would say, oh, that's St. Peter. It's in St. Peter's Cathedral. But in actual fact, that statue originally was part of a pagan system, and it was called Jupiter. And you see on its head, you have the sun god, Jupiter, reflecting power from the sun god. So images were taken from paganism, brought into the church as an attempt to help the pagans feel more comfortable in Christian churches. But the Bible made it very plain when it said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. God wanted us to come and kneel before his throne and to allow his Holy Spirit to impress our minds as we prayed. But the pagans always had a number of gods, and the pagans felt more comfortable praying through idols. So images of saints were made, as intercessors rather than the Holy Spirit interpreting prayers before God. So changes began to occur in those early centuries. Daniel 7 verse 25 describes another one of those changes, that they would think to change times and laws in those early centuries. The question is raised, how will the pagans feel more comfortable in the church? Now, in the early Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed, Book 7, Section 2, here it is, directly from the Apostles' Creed. O Lord Almighty, Thou hast created the world by Jesus Christ, and has appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof, both in the Ten Commandments and in the Book of Genesis and in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles believed in the Sabbath, they believed in the seventh-day Sabbath, and they believed that the Sabbath was a sign that God had created the world. But during this age of compromise, the pagans' day of the sun was slipped into the church. Some Christians had begun worshiping on Sunday in honor of the resurrection to disassociate themselves from the Jews that the Romans hated. Because when the Romans looked at the Christians who were worshiping on the Sabbath, they thought they were just a Jewish sect following Jesus Christ of the Nazarene, you see. And they thought that Jesus was just another Roman, another Jewish leader. But many of these Christians who were being persecuted by the Romans now wondered how can we take the sting of persecution off ourselves and how can we unite with the pagans well, the pagans were worshipping on the day of the sun, a number of them in these tribes. Now notice in the book, The Development of the Christian Doctrine, page 372. We are told by Eusebius, he's a great historian. See, these things weren't done in a corner, friend. You ask me why there's so many different denominations. And unless you understand the progression of the church from apostolic purity through persecution down into compromise, you'll never understand why we have so many different denominations today. But history reveals what happened. We are told by Eusebius, the historian, that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. 
What did Constantine and the early church leaders do? They transferred the ornaments of paganism into the Christian church. Images. The worship of the sun, Sunday. In fact, Constantine's coins had his picture on one side and the sun god on the other side. Here is the famed historian Arthur B. Stanley who says, his, Constantine's coins, bore on the one side the letters of the name of Christ and on the other, the figure of the sun god. And then... Stanley goes on, as if Constantine could not dare to relinquish the patronage of the bright luminary. Constantine and his army became Christians. It is said that when Constantine's army became Christians, they rode their horses through the river while the bishop held up his hand and said, I baptize you. But it was as if Constantine could not give up his allegiance to the sun god and with church leaders united in bringing pagan practices into the church. But there is still a commandment. There was then and is now. Exodus 20 verse 11. Read it with me please. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it written with the finger of God on tables of stone, never to be eradicated. Remember the Sabbath day. It stands today as a great monument of creation. Notice what the historian says. The retention of the old pagan name of Des Solis, or Sunday, is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects. Pagan and Christian alike as the venerable day of the sun, the history of the Eastern Church. Now notice what's happening. Compromise is taking place. Pagan and Christian sentiments are united. But again, from Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, God blessed the what? Seventh day. He sanctified it because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. Satan was attacking the Creator. Satan was attacking the Bible. Satan was attacking the truth in the Compromise period. In fact, just as in the Old Testament, Ezekiel the prophet talked to Israel's religious leaders when they profaned the Sabbath and God's law, this same principle applies to what happened in the fourth century under Constantine and the church leaders. Her priests have violated my law. The priests, Ezekiel said, the religious leaders violated the law. They profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the clean and the unclean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them, Ezekiel 22, 26. As in Israel's day in the early centuries, the religious leaders, uniting with the state, hid their eyes from the Sabbath to bring in pagan practices to accommodate the pagans. In the Black Horse period, from 323 A.D. to 536 A.D., faith was compromised. The Word of God was substituted. But there... John in Revelation looked up into heaven and he saw the opening of the fourth seal. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation 6 verse 7 and 8. The fourth horse horse death rides on it. The church goes from apostolic purity. It goes from a vibrant church that's triumphing and the gospel is moving cities, nations, and countries. It goes to the blood-stained faith of persecution. It goes to the black faith of compromise. But then death rides in the church. There is spiritual death, the dark ages. And during the dark ages, God's people again are killed with the sword. They're starved with hunger and and with death, those long centuries of the dark ages, it is as if death rides.
the horse of the church. Now notice what the historian says. The new Christians, that is these pagans and Christians that came in the church, the new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism. We're reading Centuries of Christianity, a concise history, page 58. See, if you go back to history, you can understand. On the contrary, hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. When you have church councils taking the place of the Bible, when you have tradition standing in the place of God's way, when you have human works as the means of salvation rather than God's grace, when you have images substituted for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when you have Sunday substituted for Sabbath, when you have pagan practices come into the church, the Bible calls that a what faith, everybody? A dead faith. Indeed, church and state united. And there followed persecution for those that didn't go along. One historian in church history, century 2, chapter 2, section 7, says this. Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed, what is it? Baptized paganism. So now the church has fallen. Now the medieval church might be termed as baptized paganism. Now church councils and church decrees take the place of the word of God. Now men and women are persecuted for their faith. Those who are stalwarts for God's word. Those that stand for God's truth. Those that have their minds chained by the Bible and who are faithful to God, many of them. The history of the Middle Ages is the history of men and women that are faithful to God. It's the history of a church that has fallen. But it's the history of men and women with great courage. Traditions have come into the church. Penances have come into the church. Indulgences have come into the church. Images have come into the church. The church hierarchy has come in and human dogmas have indeed come in. But would God's truth be trodden down forever? Would God's truth be trampled underfoot forever? Would God allow the church to go from apostolic purity of white to persecution of blood red to compromise of the black horse period to spiritual death? Would God do nothing? Was God's voice to be muted? Would there be error on the throne forever? What indeed would happen? The Bible says that just as the sun rises over the mountains chasing away the darkness, so the sun of God's word would rise over the mountain of error, over the rubbish of fabrication, that the sun would rise, listen, Proverbs 4, verse 18, the path of the just the path of the righteous person, the path of the godly person, is as the shining light, the sunrise, that shines more and more to the perfect day. 500 A.D., the pale horse period, 600, 700, 800, 900. 500 years go by, 600 years go by, 1200, 1300 A.D. In the 13th century, the Bible was placed by the medieval church on the list of forbidden books not to be read. Under penalty of law, no one could read the Bible. God said, this is enough. The path of the just must shine. The light of truth must shine. The light of truth would penetrate the darkness, like the sunrise over the mountain, dispelling the night. Indeed, faithful men and women began quietly at first, secretly at first, 12th, 13th century, to follow the instruction of Jude, the Jude just before Revelation, that little book, Beloved, while I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, Jude 3. 
God said, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. God said, light will shine. Men and women will be willing to give their lives. They'll be willing to place their time, their efforts, their energy. They'll study diligently in quiet mountain passes. And God began to raise up fathers and mothers and raise up teenage children and raise up university professors and raise up peasants and artisans independently of each other. At first, they began to study the Bible. And families from the great cities of Europe would begin moving into the countryside. Peter Waldo was one of the first of these, and he began to develop a group of people that were faithful to the Bible. They moved into northern Italy, into southern France. Here you're looking at a hidden Waldensian mountain village. They had little villages up in the mountains, far away from the popular church, far away from the tentacles of those that would persecute them and destroy them. In these mountain villages, often, they met in caves. And in their caves, they had great rock tables. These are original shots from the caves in the Waldensian villages. And in these tables, the Waldensian men and women would spend hours and hours copying the Bible. They would take their brightest young people, their most intelligent university students. They would, the mothers would make long flowing robes. They would sew the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, the Book of Romans, some of the prophecies. They would hide them in their long flowing robes. These students, some of the brightest in the universities, would leave their mountain villages. They would go down as Students in the university, their parents would go as merchants selling pots and pans into the marketplaces. And when they found honest-hearted seekers locked in error, locked in medieval superstition, when they found men that were longing for salvation, climbing stairs on their knees, lighting candles, where they found men involved in pomp and pageantry, but it did not reach the heart because there was no Jesus in it. When they found men and women locked trying to work their way to heaven, they would share with them their priceless manuscripts from the Bible that came from these copyist tables. Soon there were little glowing lights all over Europe. The faith was compromised from 100 A.D., to 500 AD, 400 years from the white horse to the red horse to the black horse to the pale horse. And God could not give all the light of truth to any one group all at once. Have you ever been in a dark room and you've walked out? What happens if you walk out of a dark room into the brightness of the sun? What happens? You don't see anything. It blinds you. And so God would take time to restore truth. And God raised up the Waldensians. And they believed the Bible and the Bible only. But their creed had many errors. They didn't understand many of the truths of the Bible. Because God can't reveal all the truth to one person who's coming out of that darkness overnight. And so God raised up. A faithful man in the Czech Republic, John Huss. And Huss, as he studied the Bible, this great man of God, this great man of faith, said, obedience to God is my motto. My mind is chained by the Bible. Not obedience to the church, not obedience to priests, not obedience to bishops, not obedience to prelates. Come with me. As our It Is Written film cameras come to Czechoslovakia, Prague, there the Czech Republic, John Huss. I remembered when I stood there in Prague, Huss, in his experience of being burned at the stake, this mighty man of God, mighty man of faith, to him the Bible meant something. Obedience to God was his motto. His persecutioners came. They lit the torches beneath his feet. And as John Huss was martyred, July 6, 1415, he died in the flames saying, Obedience to God is my motto. Would that men and women today would have that same motto. That obedience to the Bible, obedience to God, obedience to truth, not to tradition, not indeed to the popular church. John Huss from 
the Czech Republic, John Huss spurred a revival all through the Slovakian regions there. God moved. The faith of Jesus is going to be restored. Truth cast down is going to be lifted up. But God can't do that in one generation. God can't do that with one mind. They would all have pieces of the puzzle. They would all put those pieces together. The Waldensians said, the Bible and the Bible only. John Huss said, obedience to God is my motto. And God raised up a man by the name of Martin Luther. Simple parish priest who struggled with how to know God. Who struggled with how he could be saved in God's kingdom. A parish priest that came to a country village in Germany called Wittenberg, a parish priest that shook the world. Because as he studied the epistle to the Romans, he read passages like, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. He read passages like the one in Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God. And Martin Luther knelt there in his simple cell, and he said, Lord... All the penances haven't saved me. All the fasting hasn't saved me. All the flagellations on my back haven't saved me. Only Jesus Christ can save me. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved except Jesus. And Martin Luther introduced to the Christian church a point, a principle, a doctrine that it had lost as a church since those early centuries. Because the works of man had replaced the grace of God. And so God raised up Martin Luther to echo and re-echo the truth that salvation comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. But you say, Mark, wait a minute, I have a question. Why are there so many different denominations? Here's why. Follow me closely. Luther was a mighty man of God, but he did not know all the truth. Luther still practiced sprinkling babies. He didn't understand the truth about immersion. Luther actually believed that the state should force people to worship. He did not understand about religious freedom. You see, Jesus said something to his disciples that was extremely significant. John 16, verse 12, read it with me, please. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The Waldensians didn't know all the truth. They had part of it. John Huss didn't know all the truth. He had part of it. Martin Luther did not have all the truth. He had part of it. But the problem is this. The, the Waldensians who followed Peter Waldo, many of them said, we're not going to go on. If our leader Peter Waldo didn't teach it, why should we accept it? We are Waldensians. The Hussites who followed John Huss said, if John Huss didn't teach it, why should we accept it? We are Hussites. The Lutherans said, if Martin Luther didn't teach it, why should we accept it? Because he was a mighty man of God. We are Lutherans. Are you beginning to see where the different denominations now came from? God rose up, God caused to rise up different men these men who rose up from God were used of God, mighty men of God, but they didn't know all the truth. Their followers only went as far as they went. You go to Geneva, and there in Geneva, Switzerland, is that great man of God, John Calvin. And where Luther emphasized God's grace, Calvin took not only Luther's writings, but other reformers' writings, and Calvin talked about Christian growth, the importance of prayer, the importance of Bible study, the importance of letting God sanctify you inside. Oh, the Presbyterians went to Calvin and said, if this is what John Calvin believed, we believe it, let's rally around Calvin and start a new church, and up came the Presbyterians. Why, now we have the Waldensians, the Hussites, the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians, and they keep coming, friends. God is leading people out of the darkness. They do not understand all the truth. 
It took 400 years to go from the white horse period to the pale horse period. And God does not reveal all of his truth in one generation to one person. In fact, God then raised up a whole group of people in Europe. As they studied the Bible, they read the Bible very plainly. And they said, wait a minute, the Bible teaches that baptism is not by sprinkling or pouring. And where the Calvinists and the Lutherans, Hussites and Waldensians, they don't understand baptism. They said, if we're really going to follow the Bible, we better follow baptism the Bible way by immersion. And so the Baptists were raised up. And the people said, wait a minute, if this is what our Baptist leaders taught, we better indeed follow it, because we're going after what Jesus said. Jesus said, go you therefore, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus taught baptism was not by sprinkling or pouring, but by immersion. But Christ was attempting to give every person a little piece of the puzzle because he was putting together his last day movement. He was leading the church out of the darkness. Some people say to me, Mark, Pastor Finley, what do you really believe? Where do you stand on faith? Well, in a sense, I'm a Waldensian because I believe in the Bible and the Bible only. Don't you, friends? In a sense, I'm a Hussite because I believe that obedience is to God and not a man-made institution. What about you, friend? In a sense, I'm a Lutheran. A good Lutheran because I believe that salvation is only by grace in Jesus Christ. I thank God for Martin Luther. In a sense, I believe in at least one aspect of what Calvin taught. Again, each of these men had error. And God was giving them a little truth. But I certainly believe in Christian growth. When you come to Jesus, he indeed leads you to keep growing as a Christian, right? Amen. I'm a Baptist, and you'll see that Saturday night here when you come, many of you, into the Bible pool of baptism. And all around the world, men and women have come to these meetings, are walking through the waters of baptism. God gave a little truth to each one. Certainly, in a sense, I'm a Methodist. John and Charles Wesley saw the church in a spiritual condition in which it drifted away from God. And they called the church to holiness. Does the church need to be called to holy living today? Away from the honky-tonks and the nightclubs? Today, you can be a Christian in some churches and live like the world. But the Bible calls us to holiness. It calls us to living for God. Jesus was restoring truth because in the last days, God would raise up a group of people that longed for his coming and all of the truths would be restored before Jesus would come to the world. All of the truths that were lost sight of, the Bible and the Bible only, obedience, the grace of God, growth in Christian life, baptism by immersion, holiness of living, separation from the world. Then God raised up a man by the name of William Miller. Now, God raised up William Miller in the United States. At this time, the church, most church leaders believed that there would be a long period, a thousand years of peace on earth before Jesus came. When William Miller began studying the prophecies of the Bible, he saw that Jesus was coming literally and visibly in the clouds of heaven to give out the rewards. William Miller began to study the prophecies of Scripture. And as he did, he saw that Jesus was coming and that when Christ came, the righteous dead would be resurrected. The righteous living would be caught up in the sky. William Miller in the United States, Manuel Lacunza, a priest down in South America, Johann Bengel over in Germany, Edward Irving in England, all over Europe, South and inter America, in the early 1800s, God was now putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. God was going to raise up a divine movement of destiny that stood on the shoulders of these great reformers. And God began to shake. God began to move. William Miller began to preach about the second advent. 
The Christian church at this time was not thinking about Jesus' soon coming. But one of those great principles of the Bible, the second coming of Christ, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, must be preached before Jesus returned to the world. William Miller got out his time charts of his prophecies and beasts and began to preach. And as he did, thousands and thousands accepted Jesus. They accepted the principles of the Bible. They accepted the words of God's truth. Thousands of them came. God was bringing together people from all faiths and creeds because God wanted to restore truth in his final last day movement before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Indeed, Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, read it with me, please. If you love me, keep my commandments. What truth hadn't yet been restored? The Sabbath. Although there were individuals like Andreas Fischer in Slovakia, like John James in England, like Oswald Glait in Central Europe that understood the Bible Sabbath, Jesus said just before his coming, all truths must be restored, including the Bible Sabbath. And so God would raise up the Advent movement that would restore the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about death of being asleep, the truth about healthful living. God would have a movement on earth that believed in the Bible and the Bible only. A movement on earth that stood on the shoulders of the reformers that believed in obedience to God as the motto. A movement on earth just before the second coming of Christ that believed in the grace of God. A movement on earth that believed we must grow in Christ. A movement that accepted what the Baptists taught, baptism by immersion. A movement that stood on the shoulders of the Methodists that called for a holiness of living. A movement that believed like William Miller that Christ is coming and coming soon. A movement that restored the truth of the Sabbath. The truth about death, the truth about health, as it took the church 400 years to go from the white horse period down through the red horse, the black horse, to the compromise of the Middle Ages. So it would take some 400 years from 1400 to the 1800s for God to restore all the truths for this final, for this last generation. And so God today points us to the great issues of life. And he says in Matthew 15, verse 9, read it with me. And in vain they worship me, teachings as doctrines, the commandments of men. God is calling us calling us from error, calling us from falsehood. He's calling us to gather all the truths together and to be part of his last day people. The Bible says that there would be a repair done, a restoration done. The book of Isaiah says, you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, God's last day people would repair the break in the wall of truth. It would restore the pieces in the puzzle. It says, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. And if you call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, God would bring his last day people together in the book of Revelation. God's last day people are outlined there. Somebody says, how can I find in all these churches God's people? Here's what it says, Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here's the endurance. God says, my people have hung on. My people have not given up. Here's the endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God would have a last day people. They would believe in the Bible and the Bible only. They would believe that salvation is only through Christ. They would believe that obedience to God was their motto. They would accept baptism by immersion. They would believe in holiness of living. They would look forward to the second coming of Christ. They would be Sabbath-keeping Adventist Christians in the world today. Not another denomination. Not merely another movement. But giving a trumpet call to restore all the truths of the Bible. You see, for the great issues of life, for every one of the greatest issues of life, Satan has a counterfeit and God's church would restore it. One of the great issues in religion is who has authority? 
Satan's counterfeit is the church councils. But the truth of the matter is God's word has authority. The great issue of Christian life is prayer. Satan's counterfeit is pray through images. God's truth is the Holy Spirit will impress your mind. You don't need images. The great issue of the Christian life is salvation. Satan's counterfeit is human works. God's truth is Christ's grace. You're saved by grace. Great issue with the Christian life is intercession. Satan's counterfeit is priests for intercession. God's truth is Christ is your intercessor. Greatest issues of the Christian life is worship. Satan's counterfeit is the pagan Sunday. God's truth is the Bible Sabbath. Greatest issues of the Christian life, death. Satan's counterfeit is the immortal soul, paganism. God's truth is sleep until the resurrection. Greatest issues of the Christian life, how are you baptized? Satan's counterfeit sprinkling. God's truth immersion. Greatest issues of the Christian life, your body, the temple of God. Satan's counterfeit. The health laws are abolished. God's truth, the health laws are eternal. Get ready to meet Jesus and lay your body on the altar. Friend of mine, it's no accident you were brought to these meetings. It's no accident that you got that brochure in the mail. It is no accident that you saw that TV ad. It is no accident that a friend invited you here. It's no accident that you once were with God's people and you drifted away. These are the final times. The issues are great. The issues are between God's truth and Satan's counterfeit. And God has raised up a last day Sabbath keeping Adventist movement to gather all the truths of the past to lead men and women back to the Bible. Tonight as we bow our heads to pray, deep within your heart, have you sensed that tugging influence of the Holy Spirit? Have you sensed that Jesus Christ has been leading you? Do you know in your heart that it is no accident that you are here? That God has led you to this place, to this time? Do you understand that the reason there are so many different denominations is because so many people camped? They camped, friend, around their religious leaders. But Jesus says to you, follow me. Jesus says to you, don't stop. Don't camp around your religious leaders. Don't camp around a church you were born in. Don't camp around some denomination that came from your parents. Jesus said all the pieces are put back to the puzzle tonight. Jesus said, you see my truth, and you know what the counterfeit is, and you know what the truth is. And Jesus says to you tonight, deep within your heart, commit your life to me. Deep within your heart, tell me you'll follow me. You may be frightened, you may be afraid. The future may look dark and perplexing. But you can rake, shout, and take Jesus' hand. You may be weak, but he's strong. You may be powerless, but his might will hold you by the hand as we pray tonight. Would you like to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want to follow your truth. And Jesus, wherever it leads me, give me the courage and give me the strength. Wherever you are tonight, would you like to lift your hand? In great European cities, would you like to lift your hand? In quiet villages, would you like to lift your hand? Here in Orlando, would you like to lift your hand? Throughout the United States and Canada, would you like to lift your hand? By lifting your hand tonight, you're saying, Jesus, I might not have understood this before, but I see tonight truth has been compromised. I see tonight that truth has been fallen, and tonight I'm lifting my hand, Lord. There are tens of thousands lifting their hands, and, but you see mine, Lord. You know my heart. I'm one person to you, and I just want to lift my hand, Lord, because I want to follow you. I want to follow you because you lead me. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that when we lift our hand and put our hands in your hand, you'll never let us go. Thank you, Lord, for revealing truth to us. Thank you that we can walk on and follow that truth. In Christ's name.